Hello, everyone. Welcome back to day one of Spring One's Agile Leadership Breakout Track. Next up, we have Sarah, Megan, Megna, and Rachel from the University of Washington discussing proactively designing for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Megna, over to you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Rick, for that introduction. We are so excited to be here today to share our talk with all of you. Our talk today is called Proactively Designing for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, a toolkit to spark discussion and provide guidance to product teams. We're going to be sharing a resource that we've created that supports designers, engineers, product managers, and other members of product teams in actively and intentionally centering equity in the product development process. I'm gonna start with some introductions. Uh, here's our team. My name is Meghna Nayak. Rachel Feltis and I are both user experience designers and then Sarah Koek and Megan Peasley are user experience researchers. We met at the University of Washington where we were all enrolled in the same design program and we worked on our capstone together earlier this year. Today, what we're gonna be sharing with you is one of the artifacts that came out of that project. So since we're talking about DEI today uh, and we're gonna be using these terms quite a bit, uh, we thought it would be helpful to get everyone on the same page and define a couple of the things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so I'm going to start with diversity, which represents the composition of different people, uh, pe people in a group of different races, genders, religions, sexual orientations, etc. Equity differs from equality. Marginalized groups are treated in a proportional way to account for societal obstacles. Inclusion means that people from diverse groups feel welcome and can participate in a space without backlash. This is the end goal of DE&I efforts. Discrimination is when a person or group is treated differently based on their race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. And harassment is unwanted attention or action towards a person or group. So we think that this topic is super important because technology is not neutral. Products and platforms can be designed in ways that facilitate inclusion, or conversely, they can allow harassment, discrimination, and bias to happen on their platforms. There have been countless headlines in the news in the past few years about products facilita facilitating this sort of discrimination online. We've heard of dating apps that allow users to block entire groups of people based on ethnicity or religion. We've heard stories of platforms designed to connect neighbors and build community, instead being used for racial profiling. We've heard of social media websites accusing Native Americans of using fake names because their names were not compatible with input field logic. These are just a few examples of products that are used by millions and millions of people that facilitate discrimination at scale. It has become clear that even a platform that's designed to be neutral can still facilitate bias. And so it's not enough to be neutral. We need to consciously build with equity in mind. And to do this, we need to center the most vulnerable users. And just to reinforce why it matters, numerous platforms have come under fire for design choices that enable prejudicial modes of thought and action. Technology is powerful and it's both in moral interests and in business interests to create inclusive technology products. And now Megan will share a little bit of context about this project and how it came to be. Thanks, Megna. So this effort was kicked off earlier this year as Megan talked about with our capstone sponsor, Karina, who is a technology nonprofit that focuses on home care and child care matching. It's a place where clients can find providers who fit their particular needs. Our prompt with Karina was to help them evaluate their existing products through the diversity, equity, and inclusion lens and make some concrete design suggestions that could help improve their product in this regard. So as we were getting started as a group and as a team, um, we started to read a lot of those cautionary tales that Megna was talking about, um, about how platforms are intentionally and unintentionally discriminating against users. We read a lot of lofty academic papers around DEI and where it works well and where it doesn't work well. But none of these really translated to how we as a team focusing on design solutions could take action. Um, additionally, we read uh, corporate and HR policies around this topic of DEI but we really saw that there was, a miss, there was a missing space of guidance on how we as designers and researchers can actually center equity in the design process and make decisions that account for this. So what we did is we decided to create our own research, our, our own resource based on our research. 
So we took those lofty academic papers and cautionary tales and paired that with a competitive analysis, looking at marketplace style or matching platforms, such as dating apps and service matching platforms that brought all and brought all of this into a list of questions for us as a team to evaluate our sponsor's platform through a heuristic evaluation. And as we were using these questions in our own project and in this own space, we found immense value in what we were starting to create and continuing to work on it and iterate to make it usable for others. So this, um, that initial list of heuristic questions, we took that and created a toolkit, um, which is what you'll, we'll be talking about more today. Um, this toolkit uh, really focuses on platforms where users are connecting with one another on the, on the space. It's made up of 20 different prompt cards to consider, which you see a sample of on the screen here. And it's organized into seven different themes that cover how information is shared, developing trust, humanizing users, structuring interactions, how users are supported by the platform, tracking and measuring impact, and finally, the company policy. And each prompt includes an overarching question, the context to why it's important or why it matters, and some examples to consider. And for the examples that we'll dive into a bit deeper further on, um, there's no right or wrong answer since there's no one size fits all solution for DEI work. Instead, these prompts should help teams to start to think more critically about how their platform is designed and at the end of the end of the day, how the platform either enables or reduces discrimination. The toolkit is set up to use, be used in a couple of different ways. It can be used to generate new ideas for a platform, iterate on current designs, and evaluate existing products. This can be done individually or in a workshop setting. And as a part of the toolkit, we create a template for that workshop, which you can see on the screen here. It involves steps for groups to set the stage and define the context and goals for what they're trying to do and um, improve on, use the prompts to actually conduct the DEI analysis, and then identify what's missing from the toolkit for you and your context, because we can't have answered all of the questions that um, teams should be asking, and finish with making a plan of what's next, where are the changes that need to be made, where are questions that you should take in research with the users and what you should do moving forward. So now Sarah and I will talk through a few examples of the DEI prompts and discuss how our team used this toolkit to analyze and identify areas for improvement on our sponsor Karina's care matching platform. So I'm not going to give an example of a totally correct or incorrect way to design for DEI. That's because so much here is really dependent on context, who your users are and how they're using your product. So while these examples won't give you all the answers, they should hopefully open you up to having these conversations with your teams and with your users to figure out what approach may be the most equitable and inclusive in your context. So the first example is around the question of when it is appropriate to show profile pictures of users. One prompt from our toolkit asks us, what personal user information is shared on your platform and does it need to be shared? Sharing users' information can help others empathize with them or it could enable discrimination. You should think about the trade-offs you're making when sharing user information like names and photos. For example, dating apps show user profile photos. That could trigger appearance-based stereotypes like racism, ageism, and sexism. In spite of this, it still makes sense to have pictures in a dating app because doing so lets users authentically share about themselves. People tend to be on a dating app to form an in-person connection, so you can see why they might want to share their image with a potential match. Another prompt from our toolkit related to profile pictures asks us, when do people learn information that could be used to fuel stereotypes or discrimination? By planning when and what users learn about each other, platforms can delay stereotyping until after key decisions have been made or after users have already overcome initial biases. In this second example, it makes sense that a rideshare driver would want to see a user's photo and name to ensure a smooth pickup. It's easier to find the rider if you know what they look like. However, seeing the rider's photo before accepting the ride allows the driver to potentially deny service based on appearance. This is a real scenario that has enabled racial discrimination on apps like Uber and Lyft. What the rideshare app could do instead is hide the name and picture of passengers until after the ride is confirmed. 
This prevents rejecting rides based on appearances. Although we should consider that this decision does not completely eliminate biases, but may only shift them to when the users meet in person. In the case of my team's project with Karina, the care matching app, we spent a lot of time researching and discussing whether to show profile pictures for the caregivers on their site. We were initially leaning towards hiding the pictures to prevent appearance-based discrimination. After considering these prompts and conducting user interviews, we actually switched tracks to recommend giving users the choice to show their profile pictures. In the very intimate personal caregiving space, we found that users wanted to share their whole selves in order to find a better caregiving match. This also came with a side effect of filtering out the more explicitly bigoted people online before the clients met in person. As another real life example that might be familiar with the audience, we have Airbnb which is actually currently struggling to overcome a problem of racist discrimination. This problem was first exposed in 2016 with a Harvard study which revealed that distinctively African-American guests were far less likely to have a booking accepted than distinctively white guests. One change that Airbnb has since made is to de-emphasize profile pictures. You can see in this screenshot that the host's profile image is quite small and located at the bottom of the page. Similarly, guest profile pictures are completely hidden from hosts until after they have accepted a booking. My second example for you is around the question of how user ratings and reviews could be structured to reduce bias. Our first prompt asks, is user feedback structured to encourage accuracy and reduce bias? Reviews or testimonials can be used to increase trust. However, there is still the opportunity for users to be biased when leaving reviews, and that needs to be considered. Using specific questions and clear context can help structure good reviews. In the example on the left, if there were only one rating category, for example, rate the seller from one to five, users would be forced to create their own definition for that rating. This would allow the user's judgments of quality to be more influenced by stereotypes and bias. By prompting feedback on specific categories, as in this example, it reduces bias while producing more informative, trust-building reviews for other users. The second prompt from our toolkit asks us about who can lead user reviews. One thing to note is that people are more likely to leave a review after an especially positive or negative experience. One way we found to create more balanced reviews is through reciprocal reviews. In this example on the right, from a short-term vacation home rental app, both the renter and the host can leave reviews. This helps to build mutual trust. In the case of our sponsor, Karina, they were not using ratings or reviews in their application. We used the DEI toolkit to identify this as a potential gap and start a conversation on other ways they might work to establish trust between users. Back to our Airbnb example, we can see that they are taking a balanced approach when it comes to reviews. At the top, they show structured specific ratings on things like cleanliness, communication, accuracy, and location. Notice that users aren't being asked to make a general rating of the host themselves. This more objective section is at the top and free text reviews are shown below to allow for personal thoughts and opinions to still be shown. The third example I want to talk about is around the topic of using indications of trust to combat bias. One prompt from our toolkit that applies to this is, how does the platform indicate user expertise or legitimacy? Indications of expertise make users see each other as trustworthy and can help mitigate implicit biases. These can include authentication steps or verified badges on profiles, as we often see on things such as Twitter. In this example, a check mark shows that a user's expertise is verified. This helps other users focus on the things that matter, such as qualifications, rather than relying on stereotypes based on the user's name or picture. In the case of our sponsor, Karina, they were already doing a lot to establish user trust by only allowing legitimate users on the platform and highlighting caregiver certification. We encourage them to go even further and add elements to the caregiver profile that lists things such as their education and other qualifications. Looking at Airbnb, we can see that there are several indicators of trust that the platform utilizes to help users mitigate potential bias and create better user interactions. 
The superhost or plus markers are both indicators of trust that establish those hosts as adhering to a certain higher standard. Showing the star rating with the number of reviewers can also be used as an indicator of trust between the host and the potential guest. Going into the actual listing, you can see those same indicators listed at the top near their names. Airbnb makes sure these indicators are described so that users can better understand what these standards are and how that may impact how they react or interact with this specific host. The final example we want to talk about is regarding how you can let diverse users share their voice while preventing others from making bias based on that voice. One prompt from our toolkit that applies to this is, are you encouraging unbiased interactions through structure or cues? Adding structure to your user interactions helps them act appropriately and without bias. Preventing discrimination or harassment by intervening before an instance of potential bias can occur. This messaging feature of a buy and sell app suggests initial messages. This structured shortcut demonstrates the type of messages that would be appropriate for a first interaction on this specific platform. Another prompt from our toolkit that applies to the question of user voice is, how does your platform handle free text entry? User enter text may have unintentional side effects. People may have different language proficiencies, regional and cultural linguistic differences, or be non-native speakers. A grammar and spell checker in free text fields can help users express themselves how they want without risk or judgment based on certain language skills. In the case of our sponsor, they have taken the approach of limiting users from entering free text because they didn't want users to be discriminated against based on spelling or language proficiency. Although this decision certainly prevented that kind of bias, we found that it was making a trade-off and may actually have limited users from showing their personality or their authentic selves we recommended that they start incorporating structured, optional free text fields on their user profiles with prompts asking caregivers to share about what makes them unique as a caregiver or what they enjoy doing on weekends. We also recommended to our sponsor that they add a spell checker in these free text fields to help users express themselves how they want. Back to the example of Airbnb, the platform prompts users in their free text entries through both guided questions as well as suggested answers that would be appropriate for this text box. This gives users guidance on what context this question is in and what possible responses would entail. This can help reduce biased actions by giving clear direction for the information that is being sought out and is appropriate for this context. This is a starting point. Um, please remember that this toolkit is really just a starting point and not a one size fits all solution to the continued challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion. To make efforts towards DEI, it's important to make sure that you measure the impact of any changes you make to see if they're, they are successful and to also continue researching the problem space for new information and cases as they arise. It's important to continue putting the users at the forefront of your goals and ensure that their voices and concerns are being heard. Ultimately, it's important to remember that in order for issues related to DEI to be solved, we have to stop simply making promises to make things better and start taking action to make them a reality. In order to start tackling the space, we wanted to ensure that this toolkit was available to anyone and everyone who is interested. If you would like to learn more about the toolkit or check out the full cards, please visit our website, which has all of the information you might need and that we worked on. There's also a way to contact us through the website if you have any comments, questions, or concerns about the toolkit or our research. Um, that was it for us today. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to listen to us. And it was truly a pleasure for us to be able to speak to you all today. Thank you, Sarah, Megan, Megna, and Rachel. Um, I think that's a very important topic. It was helpful to me personally. I, I always like it when a talk makes me rethink things I've done in the past and improve in the future. Um, please click the link that should be in the your talk's Slack channel to ask questions and continue the discussion with our speakers. I'd encourage you not to miss the chance to ask questions and learn more about the DEI toolkit.